thousands of viewers and subscribers. Yeah. Okay, tens of viewers and subscribers. But um, today we're going to talk about or compound bullions and an and uh, just my attempt at compound bullion humor. So today is kind of a cool day in the world of, of uh, logic where we're going to make our logic a little more complicated by adding and or and not to our bullions, which make them way more powerful and flexible. Um, the, uh, we're, we're going to be adding our first, uh, the first section of this lesson though is talking about these evil, complicated, nested, if statements. And then, uh, as I've shown you before, I hope, uh, this code folding or hitting those little pluses and minuses really help with your, your if statements and keeping things organized. I'm going to start today's lesson with a video. Um, it's a six minute video from a colleague I don't know. Um, he's teaching this uh, lesson for the AP. Um, some students uh, are taking this course completely on their own through the AP. It's a complicated thing, but um, they, they, they are, uh, their teachers are just assigning them these videos to watch. And I thought this one was, and I, I watch them to get ideas too. I thought this one was particularly good. So um, we're gonna play this video in class here. Um, and I'm gonna mute myself so we don't have that weird echo. And here we go. My name is Tim Gallagher, and I'm an AP computer science teacher from Winter Springs High School, just outside of beautiful Orlando, Florida. And today's topic is 3.5. This is compound Boolean expressions. And in today's video, the first of three, we will be introducing nested if statements. So what will we learn? Our learning objective is that we're going to be representing branching logical processes by using nested conditional statements. And those are basically just if statements within other if statements. Let's look at an example. So here I've got a program that I wrote called nested if tester. And it starts out, I have an integer called number that I initialize to 36. Then I've got a series of if statements. And in the first one, I check to see if number is greater than 20, it is. So then it goes inside the curly braces to my second if statement. And here I'm looking to see if number mod six equals zero. Basically I'm checking to see if number is divisible by six. It is, so it's gonna to go to this first print statement and it's gonna print out number is greater than six and divisible by six. Great, so that's an if statement inside of another if statement. What if I change the number to 40? Well, same situation. I'm going to see is my number greater than 20? It is. So I'm going to go inside again to the second if statement, but here number 40 is not divisible by six. So it's going to skip over this if and go to the else associated with it. And it's going to go to the print line and print out that number is greater than six, but not, or number is greater than 20, but not divisible by six. Again, looking at the if statement inside of the if statement. But now what if I set number equal to 12? Well, here, when I go to the first if statement, is number greater than 20? It's not. So here, I'm going to skip over the curly braces and go right to the else, and it's going to print out that number is not greater than 20. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute, but number is divisible by 6 because it's 12. And that's true. However, because the second if statement where I checked for that mod 6 is inside of the first if statement and the first if statement evaluated to false, I never get a chance to check for mod 6. And that's one of the rules when we have our nested if statements. If the first one is true, it evaluates the second one. But if the first one doesn't evaluate to true, you'll never get to the second if statement inside. And that's how our nested if statements work. One thing to be aware of though, and that's the dangling else. So what's a dangling else? Well, here's another program. And this one says, I've got an integer called a that I set equal to 20. And you'll notice the first if statement I have, again, here's a pair of nested if statements. I'm looking to see if a is greater than 30. It's not. So where does it go? Well, it looks like in this case that it would immediately go to the else and print out a series of question marks, right? But does it because whose if statement does that else belong to? What if that else was tabbed over a little bit? 
and it was underneath the other if statement. There's two ifs, but only one else. So does the else belong to the first if or the second if? Does the indentation matter? Because here's where it was. So could we say based on indentation? Well, no, because we know Java doesn't care about indentation. That's just for our readability purposes, right? So in this case, it's kind of confusing. Does it belong to the first if or the second if? Well, the answer is that the else always belongs to the closest if that doesn't have an else. So in this case, even though I had it tabbed over to line up with the first if, that else belongs to the second if. So when I run this code, since A is not greater than 30, nothing's going to get printed to the terminal window. However, what if I really want that else to go to the first if? Can I force it? We can. I can use curly braces. And this is why it's really important to use curly braces in your code. So now, because of these curly braces, I force the else to belong to the first if and not the second if. The second if just doesn't have an else now. So now when I run this code, I get a series of question marks because A is not greater than 30. It drops to the else and prints out all the question marks in there. So be careful about, nested, about the dangling else's when using a nested if statement. So let's try some practice on your own here. I've got a code segment. I've got two variables, age and a Boolean variable called is late, and a series of if statements. Why don't we go ahead and pause the video here and evaluate what does this segment display? And when you're done, hit play again and we'll go over the answer. One second, I have that set up for us so that we can go over it. One second, please stand by. Here is that code. And um, looking at that code, what is that code going to display? I challenge you to take a few seconds to stare at it and try to figure out what that code will say and be prepared to explain what you think that code will say. Check it out. What I'm going to challenge you to do, it, well, let, let's kick everyone off the hook. Okay, what I'm going to do is I, I, I'm going to go through the way I would execute this code. And what, well, shoot, we have the video. Let's go through what the video says the uh, code will do. Why not listen to the expert? Um, here we go. All set? All set? Okay, okay here, here we go. go. So what, so what does this print out? out? Well, well, it looks, it looks like, like it's going to print, print out line, line number two and line number four. four. Let's, Let's look at why. why. Well, well, age is equal to 16, 16 and is latest late as a Boolean that's set for false. So the so first, first statement, statement asks if age is greater than 10. 10. It, it is. is. So, so it's, it's going, going to go inside to the second statement. statement. If, if is it is late, late. Well, well, is late as false, false, it's not true. So it's not going to print out line number one. But it is going to go to the else that belongs with the closest if. And print, and print out, out line, line number two. two. Then, then it's, it's going to skip, skip over this else because, because this else already belongs here. to the first, first if, if we already evaluated that to be true. true. And, and it's, it's going, going to skip, skip over the print line for line number three, and it's going to print out line number four. And that's it. And that's how our nested else, our nested if statements work. So what should we take away from here? Well, as we mentioned, we discussed represented branching logical processes by using nested conditional statements. And those are basically if statements contained within other if statements. That's it for today. Thank you so much for watching uh, AP Daily and for joining us. And we'll. Sorry about that unmutedness. That was my fault. I can't wait to hear what it sounds like on the recording. Um, sorry about that. Um, dangling ifs. Um, a critical statement that that person made, and I just added to our Quizlet, by the, or our, sorry, our GIM kit for today, is that an if always belong, an, uh, an, oops, an else always belongs to that closest if. And, um, and there is an exception, but we're going to just leave it like that because that's a good rule to uh, keep in mind. So an else always belongs to the closest if. And um, I, I love that uh, cartoon that goes with that. Now, a great way to detect which if 
your or which else your ifs go to and to keep your code straight, especially when nesting if statements, is to use this little tool on Replit and almost all coding IDEs, uh, text-based coding IDEs, use control, shift, F. It's kind of like a common shortcut, kind of like control C and control V. Control shift F on a lot of uh, compilers or a lot of IDEs will auto format your code and tab things so that you can see the nesting structure of them. In Replit, it's even in that nice corner of the, your IDE kind of across from the name of the file. There's a little box that kind of uh, looks like some kind of uh, formatting feature, and it is. When you click on that, it will automatically auto-format your code. And I just want to tell you a, a, a little story about um, auto-formatting code and the uh, world of computer science from uh, a professor I once had named Mark, who used to teach our data structures class, actually, for our the first year we did data structures and then he retired um, and then we went with Marquette which was a really good move for us anyway um, the uh, the he required we, it was an assembly programming class and he was such a stickler about style that he would take points off your assignment if you use the tab key versus using just a number of spaces so if you went tab it actually is a different unicode character than the space, 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 which is, a, a, again, a different Unicode character. So when you were programming in something like assembly, that's a really low uh, level programming language, um, that actually mattered. So again, you couldn't use tab, but you could make shortcuts. So on my keyboard, I programmed a shortcut that um, let me do the tab um, so that when I hit my tab key on my, you know, Black Widow Razor Ultimate Keyboard, it actually acted like a tab key and added, um, in, in the case, I think you wanted four spaces or three spaces, I forget. And then it automatically did that when I had it in the assembly programming mode. So getting that formatting just right in college, feel free to play those games too, because professors have reasons for everything, of course, and you want to make sure you're following their style rules. Um, the AP is a little more liberal on, they have the style rules, but they're a little more liberal on taking off points for them. I'm going to show a quick video. It's only a couple minutes. Um, I think it's three minutes, but it, and you may have seen it in APCSP, but it's just a good review of and and or, and then we're going to do some fun stuff. Well, I think fun stuff with and and or. Oops, sorry. Rody, you're muted. Funny, is my struggle real? Sorry, I was on the wrong slide. I'm muted. What is going on today? Come on, Rody, wake up. Sorry about that. This is the auto formatting tool on your IDE um, for Replit. So if you push this button here, your code will be tabbed or set up or formatted just the way you um, want it. And it's a great way to see where your ifs and else are connecting. Um, for those of you who already finished that animal challenge, very, very helpful tool, right? To, to be able to know where the, the whole point of the, that nesting if challenge, what was related to that and, and being able to do that right um, is really, really cool. So um, feel free to use that auto formatting tool in the future. Um, this is the code.org video. Um, that goes over and and or. Sam the Bat is safe from leaving the left side of the screen or from leaving the right side of the screen. Let's combine the safe left and safe right functions so that we can keep Sam safe from leaving the left and the right sides. To do both, we'll need to use compound booleans. We already know boolean expressions can return true or false. 
Well, we can combine multiple Boolean expressions together to create compound Booleans that will also return true or false. There are two functions we can use to combine Booleans, AND and OR. The AND function takes in two Booleans and only returns true if both of its Booleans are true. For example, if we asked, is this shape red? And is this shape a circle? The answer would be true because both of the booleans are true. If we ask the same questions for this circle, the answer would be false, because while one of the booleans is true, the other is false. The other way to combine booleans is with the OR, which also takes in two booleans, but returns true if at least one of the inputs is true. Let's look at this shape for an example. Is it a square or green? Is it a star or a circle? Is it a star or green? The answer to each of these questions is true. Use compound booleans to keep Sam safe from leaving the left and right sides of the screen. Hey, I remembered to unmute myself. I'm, I'm getting so much better at this. Um, first, I want to talk about your parents, especially if your parents are strict. If you are lucky enough to have strict parents, they are a classic example of an and statement because both things need to be true in order for the statement to be true. So, for example, when you were a little kid and you were eating your um, meal, you would be like, uh, do I have to eat my hamburger, fries, and green beans? And your parents would be like, you have to eat them all before you can leave the table. So you finished your hamburger and you had to finish your fries and you had to finish your green beans and you couldn't leave the table until you ate them all. All the things had to be taken care of or you couldn't leave. And statement is strict. Everything has to be true. Everything in the sequence of ands has to be true in order for the condition to be true. So true and true and true and true would be true. But true and false and true 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 is still false. Because as long as one of the statements in that chain of ands is false, the whole thing is false. So for an AND statement, it's strict. Everything has to be true or the answer is false. The OR statement is like your grandparents, though, if you're lucky enough to have really soft, nice, friendly grandparents. The OR statement is, is like just one thing has to be true and that's good enough. So if you were eating that same meal at grandma's house and you ate your hamburger, you ate your fries, but you were like, can I go even though I didn't eat my green beans? Your grandparents were nice to you and said, sure, because it, it was true that you ate your fries. It was true that you ate your hamburgers. Even though it was false that you ate your green beans, that's good enough. Or just requires one thing in the chain to be true and it's true. So true and true with an or is true. False or true is true. True or false is true. The only time it's not going to be true is if it's false or false. False or false is going to stay false. Listen to this big sequence. False or false or false or false or false or false or true, or false, or false, or false, would evaluate to true because there was just one true statement. So it's like your grandparents. As long as you show any little effort, it's good enough. So um, you can't get away with not doing anything. Your grandparents probably don't let you get away with just anything, but they only require just, a, just one little thing and you're good. That's the or statement. So we've got and, which is super strict. We got 
the or, which is super nice, just give me one. And then we got bang, the not. The not is kind of contrary. Like you're, if you're uh, lucky enough to have a little baby sister or baby brother who's always saying, no, 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 no. Whatever you say, they say the opposite. So if you say it's day, they say it's night. If you say it's hot, they say it's cold. If you say it's true, they say it's false. What the bang does, the explanation mark, the bullion not does, is it takes the condition that currently exists and flips it to the other state. So if I say not true, that would evaluate to false. If I say not false, that would evaluate to true. And it flips the logic of whatever situation you're in. Let's take a look at what we call truth tables, which you may have seen if you took um, intro to uh, no, I don't do that in intro programming anymore. Uh, you would have seen in, I, I've put it into app inventors or app creators, depending on when you took it. Um, it's basically the same course. So, um, except for this year where we're using Snap because we don't have our Android devices. But let's say we have a Boolean 1 and a Boolean 2. And we connect those with an AND statement, kind of like that IF statement listed there on that table. So if we go true and true, we get true. If we go true and false, we get false. If we go false and true, we get false. And if we go false and false, we get false. See how the AND statement is like your parents, stripped. A truth table for OR is like your grandparents. As long as one is true, you're good. So true and true is true. True and false is true. False and true is true. And false and false is false. And it's kind of organized that way for you on that nice, neat table. Some of you may have noticed a pattern that computers definitely exploit. That as soon as you, if you are giving a series of AND statements, the first time you give a false, you don't need to say anything else. You might as well stop right there, right? And that's what computers do. They call it shortcut operations. Short, uh, they shortcut it right there. So the computer actually doesn't look any further in the logic if it's all AND statements or all OR statements. As soon as it can evaluate the answer and it guarantees it knows what the answer is, it's just going to skip compiling the rest of that. Um, so it just saves time for the compiler. I also want to um, look at how that looks with just numbers. So if you look at that bottom expression there that says um, 7 equal equal 7. So is 7 equal equal to 7? Well, that's true. Do you get how that works? So it's it, it, it evaluates the, the statement there. And then let's go to the next and. And is 6 equal equal to 7? That's false, but it's going to flip it. What is not false? That's right, true. So that statement is actually true. Six is equal equal to seven, false. We have a false. If, and we're in a string of ands. So this computer would actually stop right there. It wouldn't even look at the last one. It wouldn't even bother to check because no matter what, this is going to be false, so the computer can stop. But just for our own curiosity and to be super thorough and just to go over the logic of it, 4 equals equals 3, nope, that's false. But not false is true. The same thing applies to a series of OR statements. As soon as it gets a true, it can stop because it knows the whole thing is true. So um, it might as well stop right there. Um, let, let's look a little bit too. This gives us a chance to talk about order of operations, which is the next slide. Um, but um, in this case, um, it's, it's on this slide, so I'll go over it a little bit here too. When you don't have parentheses, you just go like normal. They're on the same level, 
ands, ors, and nots are on the same level. So you just would go in order from left to right. So true and true is true. True or false would be true. True and false would be false. So that result of n is false. Now in this next case, we do it a little different because we have parentheses. And parentheses still mean first. So in this case, it goes true and false. True and false would evaluate to false. False or false is false. So that's how that works with order of operation. You do left to right, unless you have parentheses, in which case you do that first. So um, I have an expression right there. Um, I bet you can solve it. Let's let's be brave and, and wake up a little bit and hope uh, put in. Don't hit return, but put in the chat window what you think this big statement um, on the bottom, which is the the same logic is on in the in the middle there. But what do you think the answer is going to be? I'll give you a hint. It's either going to be true or false. But don't hit return yet. Just type it in and then we'll waterfall it into the chat window. So could everyone decide whether that is true or false? True or false? All right, five, four, three, two, one, hit return. All kinds of answers cascading in. Thank you, everyone. I'm glad you're awake. I was worried some of you were still sleeping. No matter how you answer, don't feel bad. This is new stuff, but let me go over it for you. Um, it went too fast. I couldn't even see if you got it right or wrong. I'm just glad you're engaged. So let's look at 7 equals equals 6. Um, that, that evaluates to false. So I still don't have a true statement. I'm going to go to the next one. 6 equals equals 7. That also evaluates to false. 42 equals equals 42, meaning of life. And 42 equals equals 42 is true. As soon as I have a true, guess what? The whole thing is true. So I could have stopped right there because this is a string of ors. So as soon as one thing's true, the whole thing is true. But just out of curiosity, 4 equal equal 2 is false, and not false is true. So not false is true. So it, the, the, it is false or false or true or true. And I only needed one true. As soon as I had that first true, the whole expression in this case was true. Getting the hang of this just requires practice, in my humble opinion. So what I've done is inside a Google Classroom, I'm going to take a few minutes and we're going to do it right in class. We have plenty of time. We're going to do it right here. I have put some code tracing practice into your Google Classroom. And I'm not going to grade it or anything. Uh, if you want to hit turn it in, that's fine. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to grade it or anything. But what I challenge you to do is go to that thing. And it's going to ask you to type true or false. False or true is true true and you'll notice it will capitalize it that's because it actually it, it be, it's google sheets and it's converting it to a boolean and um that that is the correct answer and there also is uh if and an else if practice in there oops i can't oh. well except for the system out which is done for you but uh sorry about that um i'm going to just give you a couple minutes here and I'll go to Go Guardian, so I'm available to help. And just ask you to spend some time, and I'll kind of watch. Um, if I, I really just want you to focus on the true or false, getting the hang of that. But if you get done early, feel free to do those bullions. Good practice.
By the way, don't spend too much time on the if. I just realized that that whole thing is just all frogged up. Sorry about that. I've been watching some of your screens and I'm like, ah, but it is, is all scrawled. It is all, it is all totally messed up. So my sincerest apologies on those second and third sheets. But I think um, most of you are either doing it or I think some people aren't uh, actually in the meeting. So, um, oops, 2020. Um, so I'm going to wrap it and ask that if you would be willing to come back to the meet because we have another activity to do. Um, one more activity and it is a fun one. So I want to end today with uh, more Boolean compound logic. And uh, most of the answers are gonna require you to type true or false. They're gonna be these Boolean statements that you're gonna see over and over again. Um, and so my suggestion is you might wanna copy and paste false into the clipboard so that you just type true and you copy and paste or paste down your false. Uh, there's only, oops, we're not gonna watch that. There's only one, um, there's only one, um, like traditional question and that's the one I just added um, today um, and what I'm going to ask you to do first of all is take a vote so the Among Us game went kind of long and this time I would make more imposters um, as was suggested and we can do this Among Us style or we can do it for a traditional 10 minutes it is completely up to you after this activity I have about a five minute wrap up and then we're done um, so you can, we're, either way, we're going to be done about nine o'clock. So um, feel free to put into the council whether you want um, normal or among us style. And I'm just going to take the majority vote. And if you don't vote, you don't have a voice, just like in other democracies. Um, I'm also going to stop the recording. <laughs>